Hello everyone, reporting today for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Ab Haas, and with me here is none other than Team 28596 Hypernova from California. They have been absolutely incredible this offseason, winning Alliance, winning Alliance first pick of their division at Michiana, currently ranked 10th going into the second day at MTI, just one of the most technically advanced robots I've seen in our Into the Deep season. I can't wait to jump into it on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Judica Robotics offers durable, polished, and anodized aluminum channels now available in several different color options to customize your robot at studica.com slash robots. No rough edges and a versatile hole pattern allow for positioning at multiple angles. Teams in the U.S., you can request a free sample, apply for team grants, and register for 25% off at studica.com slash robots. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and front runners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu slash first. All right, Hypernova. So I think the first question is why the rebuild? You know, you guys had a very different robot at NorCal. You still did relatively well with it, but why go with this whole new design? Yeah, so the funny thing is our current our design at NorCal was actually based on an intake that was just done in one week because we had two qualifying tournaments just prior to that. So of course after regionals we wanted to improve upon the uh, claw design which we switched to at regionals a lot more. So we definitely heavily re redesigned the intake and then uh, because of a lack of servos, we need to redesign the outtake as well. I see. Yeah, jumping right into the intake, so many degrees of freedom. Just give me a high-level overview, and then I have a ton of questions about each one. Yes, so the intake is actually able to move in many different directions, as you can see. So there's a forward, backwards, there's a perpendicular one. And what this does is it allows us to get a two-dimensional area of intaking. And uh, that means to intake a sample, we don't have to move the drive base, which is pretty slow and accurate. So yeah, talking about yeah. that two, uh, you know, that square area you guys have or rectangular area you guys have, how did you set those dimensions? Like, how did you decide how wide you wanted to be able to go? Uh, yeah, so we kind of just put whatever the longest slide that we could find that would also fit because, uh, for example, for the perpendicular slide, the max length that would fit within our currently existing drive face plates would only be around 200 millimeters. Mm -hmm. So that motivates the uh, extension for horizontal. And then for the in and out dimension, it's just uh, we reuse the same thing from regionals. Okay, yeah, and like if you could go back and change it, and you know, if a team were to look at your design and rebuild, do you, would you recommend them to go as wide as possible? You know, I, it doesn't look like you guys are 18 inches wide, are you? So would you take your robot wider so you could have that wider area when intaking, or you would keep it at what you have now? I think if we were to go with like the same design of a perpendicular slide like this, uh, we would uh, more likely to be cutting out the plates with an indent right over here mm -hmm. so that uh, the slide itself can be longer because it's still pretty important to have a thin robot uh, to avoid, like, go through gaps and avoid other robots. Awesome, yeah. One more question about your perpendicular slide, as you said. Uh, I've noticed it only moves, like, only to the left. Has that been an issue as far as uh, intaking or autonomous pathing go, or do you just shove yourselves as far to the right as you can? Uh, no, it hasn't actually been an issue, and it's actually designed specifically that way, so that during, uh, for example, during sample autonomous, we're able to pick up the last uh, sample all the way on the edge near the wall without needing to move the drive base much. That's really cool, yeah. Now, talking about this mechanism a little, we've seen uh, similar things from teams, but I'm seeing uh, pulleys that are switching direction all which ways. Walk me through the routing and why you packaged it like this. Yes, so this is a two-stage cascading. Uh, the first one is uh, this pulley and this pulley, which drive this block this way. And uh, this was designed this way because uh, vertically would kind of just not fit. Uh, yeah. And then the other one, which is uh, the second stage, is this pulley as well as this pulley right here. Uh, these ones are vertical so that they can fit like in this dimension okay. better. I see, I see. Now, going into, I see you guys also have this kind of pitching degree of freedom. Uh, is this just to get over that submersible wall, or what is that for? Yep, so one of our key uh, flaws of our previous regionals intake was the inability to drop down like that. 
And so what that resulted in is tiny sample height differences over here would uh, lead us to be unable to intake. Mm -hmm. So with this, we can just drop down firmly on the sample and it'll always like be at the right height. And is the hypernova mentality just counterspring everything? Or, you know, what's, I see you guys have some pretty beefy counterspring back here for this mechanism too. Yep, so almost everything that moves or almost everything that has a significant uh, force in the vertical direction does have counterspring. So, um, like this whole mechanism right here is actually quite heavy. Mm -hmm. So the counterspring definitely help with speed. Awesome. Now talking about the end effector over here, uh, you know, we, we've seen a lot of teams with the differential output. I see uh, some high point gears, I believe they're called, or you know, your angled bevels, but then what's going on over here with this string and pulley system? Yes, so this string uh, pulley system kind of acts as a gear, uh, except uh, when we were considering to use a gear, this distance was slightly too large to fit like a gear in a compact way. And it's also a little bit too short for belts because belts need like proper tension and uh, it would just not work that well. So the string diffie uh, solves most of those problems in a pretty compact way. Yeah, and you know, when I whenever I see string, my first thought is backlash. Mm -hmm. And so how have you dealt with like tensioning it to make sure you don't have backlash? Yeah, so the strings are tied into screws right over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, to tension, just uh, like loosen the screw, tighten the string, and then tie, uh, screw the screw back on. Okay, got it. Now talking about the claw, anything special you want to talk about as far as geometry is concerned, things that you think made a huge difference? Mm. Yeah, so this claw is pretty simple. Uh, we actually took quite a lot of inspiration from uh, Gear Wizards, I believe. And uh, yeah, so this claw also has this little funnel shape that when we drop down, it also helps to align the sample a little bit. Okay, very nice, yeah. And as far as sensors go on the intake, we're, we're gonna talk about the camera in just a second, but any other sensors on the intake that you guys are using? Uh, other than just uh, axon potentiometer mm -hmm. encoders, uh, there's just the camera, yeah. Okay, and I see at least one servo hub here. So mm -hmm. as far as wiring and management of that has gone, would you recommend teams switching to the servo hubs? Is there anything they need to be careful of there? Uh, yeah, the servo hub is very useful. We've actually got four of them on the robot. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like the main reason why it's so good is because you only have to route one power wire and one RS-485 wire to like power all of your servos. So, uh, well, well, what to watch out for is just overcurrenting. So limit the number of servos and that's about it. They're, awesome. They work very well. Yeah, and you know, while we start talking about the CV, can we get a sample in, uh, try to pick it up a couple times? And uh, Mason, why don't you walk us through everything you have going on with this program? Okay, so we have our main camera on the intake which is right under here okay yeah and then we also have a ring light around it to help with more consistent lighting uh, camera wise we also fix the exposure so that it's consistent and so that color thresholding is easier to do I see yeah and I see you guys also have another camera over here so what are you using that one for as compared to the camera down there? So this was actually kind of a former like iteration okay. where we would do a far scan with the camera mounted on the drivetrain and then we do like near scan slash like determining the angle using the intake camera mm -hmm. but we actually ran into a few issues with USB bandwidth or like processing power on the control hub and so we opted to do the far scan on the intake camera itself as okay. well. So you're pitching up when you're coming into the submersible to do the far scan and then when you're down you're getting that near scan as you're talking about, is that correct? Actually all of the vision runs while we're in this like ready position okay. kind of 45 degree angle mm -hmm. and so the far scan just has a more tolerant color filter and only cares about finding like general areas of interest. Okay before we move the intake over to get a closer look. Yeah, and then I saw, you know, as Patrick was moving the sample around in his hand, it was it was following it with fairly high frequency, I would say, as far as cameras go. What frequency are you running that, like, CV pipeline, and how did you get it that fast? Uh, the pipeline currently the runs at uh, 30 frames per second. Mm -hmm. And mainly, it was just a lot of, like, timing out. different functions, figuring we'll out what, like, smoothing functions would be the fastest and still, like, work and be able to let us be accurate. Mm -hmm. And then there's just a lot of, like, timing and optimization, cutting out unnecessary things, tuning different parameters to try to hit that, like, 
we basically aim for 30 FPS because it matches up with loop time as well. Got it. Yeah. And then talking about, uh, you know, once you've seen a sample in that near skin, are you, uh, you know, calculating exactly where you need to go? Or is it kind of just running a PID on the error between that center of that sample and the center of your camera or center of your claw, wherever you want to be? So the main camera pipeline just returns to like the main op mode returns to the main op mode, the sample position relative to that camera. And then we, because we know where the slides are and we also have robot localization, we actually calculate the like field global position. Uh -huh. And then that way, if we're moving the drive bays and the slides at the same time, we can still have that like consistent location reading. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Now talking about the transfer, you know, once you've picked up a sample, walk me through your guys' transfer process uh, and exactly what you did to make it so consistent. Because I haven't seen you guys drop any samples during transfer, and you know that's that's a really big deal as far as consistency is concerned. There. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that transfer is. So what that transfer did right there is it had this claw uh, come out over here. And then because the intake claw, it doesn't know where exactly on the sample it grabs. Mm -hmm. It kind of does a pushing motion like this to realign the sample. Okay. And after that, it just grabs and then we're done. So are you grabbing the sample kind of loosely with your intake claw in order to do that pushing motion or what exactly is making that happen? Uh, yeah, so it's just like loose enough to be able to slide but mm -hmm. not like move too much in this direction. I see. Okay, and yeah, once you've grabbed the sample, let's go through the degrees of freedom on your outtake. I see you guys have the horizontal deposit angled. Why do that? Was it just to get that extra uh, vertical or what, what's going on there? Uh, yeah, so that was, that was actually one of the motivating reasons for making it angled because uh, we were able to cut off uh, one stage of vertical sides from our previous iteration. Okay, yeah, and I see the, this is also countersprung, so walking through these constant force springs, how you spec them and how they've worked out for you guys. Yep, so uh, first, the first step of finding the right force for the counter spring was just looking at CAD, the overall weight of this mechanism, and then from that, we just use physics and the angle of the uh, of the rail to find find a rough estimate of what kind of force we need. Then, like after the robot is actually built, uh, we measured it with a force meter and then pushed and pulled, averaged the two, and then uh, that's how we're able to find the right. Awesome. Yeah. And then another question I have for you guys is regarding uh, the spool. So mm -hmm. you know, a lot of teams run the linkages. Why go with that spool? Was it packaging or was it something else as well? Yep. So the main advantage of spools, uh, as opposed to something like a linkage, is the fact that it can have a constant amount of force and like speed across the whole extension. And so, like especially with such a long extension, and uh, yeah, with such a long extension, it's pretty important to be able to like reach anywhere on it pretty easily. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's always great when teams are using schools just to have so much finer control wherever you want. Now, finally, on the deposit, we see the Axon Bevel Diffy. Anything special or advice you have for teams to making sure it's very robust? Uh, yeah, so definitely for Diffies, a really key thing is to make sure that the spacing is correct. So we've got some spacers that are not quite visible, but inside between the gear and the servo. Uh, to make sure that the spacing is perfect. Okay, yeah, got it. Now, another thing I want to talk about is specimen pickup. I know you guys have some alignment mechanisms as far as that's going on. Can you show us and show us how they work and what they're doing? So right here, uh, well, I guess the second reason why this uh, horizontal rail is angled is so that when it goes back all the way to the end, it's going to be at the perfect height to, be, uh, to pick up the specimen like this. Yeah, so I see you guys pick up by the clip. What was the main reason for that? Uh, well, partially just for fun and also uh, just to get a slightly extended range. So if we're grabbing by the clip, we can ex extend slightly farther. And then I guess the third reason is grabbing by the clip uh, is closer to the force of the chamber, so it'll be more stable. Okay, got it. Yeah, now talking about hang, I see you guys have a shifting mechanism. You're using the slides, but the slides are way too fast and too low torque normally to hang off of them. So walk us through the shifter or PTO or whatever you have going on there and how it works. Over in front, over here, uh, we've taken out a panel to make the shifter more visible. So right here, we have a shifter, a dog gear shifter that's between screw heads and go build a, a pattern spacer that basically uh, has a one-to-one -one ratio for normal 
the operation as well as a 5.28-ish uh, ratio for like fast cycling. Awesome, yeah. And as far as like making sure you're always engaging, do you have any teams for any tips for teams to make sure that you know you never have any uh, locking or anything on the on the shifter, and you always get smooth engagement? Yep. So uh, typically with like shifters like this, uh, there isn't going to be much issue with actually shifting. Uh, ours is driven by a uh, bungee cords to pull it this way into the ascent uh, mode, but then. Uh, we have a latch that actually keeps it in like during normal tie ups. So, mm -hmm. uh, like actuating that latch allows us to switch into ascent mode. I see, I see. And also about the level two hang. You know, what what are you doing here with all the with the linear rail and you know these sprung one way latches and things like that? Uh, the ascent was designed with to like keep in mind the goal of trying to keep everything else like on the robot, like the intake and outtake, uh, the same as they as optimal as they would be. So like. The key was to minimize the impact of the hang on the other system, subsystems. Mm -hmm. So, uh, before when we had a turret, there was actually a, like the turret would actually move around here. So uh, we had quite a lot of trouble trying to figure out the right length and angle to put the rail. Otherwise, it would hit the turret. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, we just came up with this after quite a lot of uh, trial and error. But uh, this basically uh, allows us to pull the robot both up off the ground as well as tilt the robot just enough to reach or to have the vertical ascent, the second stage ascent hooks on the vertical extension to actually reach the high run. Awesome, yeah. Uh, last two questions. One is the sensors I see on the side, ultrasonic sensors pointing out 45. What do you use them for? Yeah, so the sensors are used for relocalization during teleop because uh, pinpoint will probably drift. Like, even if it's a small amount of drift, it's still drift. So we want to keep uh, the robot's position quite uh, stable. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you're using them every cycle or only when you, you know, initiate a command to, how do you use them? So we kind of run them in the background, checking every 200 milliseconds for the two sensors kind of closest to our corner of the field. Sure. And we also check those only when we're like relatively straight to the field wall so that we get the best readings. And then the amount of error between our, like, the position we think we are in from the pinpoint and from what the ultrasonic sensors read is, like, averaged and then eventually written back to the pinpoint so that we update our location. I see. Yeah, and Hypernova, last question for you guys is regarding, like, the state machine and just overall code logic. You guys have just so many different, uh, you know, autonomous logics or paths that can be taken depending on what's going on and when you pick up samples and this and that are those is that like a standard library you're using is that all stuff you wrote walk us through that and what tips you have for teams to implement something similar uh it's a custom kind of state machine and command based hybrid where inside each state we have kind of like steps that are similar to commands and then so steps can run sequentially uh, or we can have like different conditions that trigger them and so it allows us to implement complex logic but with still like very readable code, it you can read it sequentially and figure out what the robot's doing. Awesome, yeah, Hypernova, thank you guys so much. I mean, just one of the most technically advanced robots I've seen this season. I think teams have a ton to learn from it. Can't wait to see how you guys do at the rest of MTI and you know other competitions and everything. So reporting for Fun Robotics Network, this is Abhas, and thank you so much to Team 28596 Hypernova. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and frontrunners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu slash first. Zutica Robotics offers durable, polished, and anodized aluminum channels now available in several different color options to customize your robot at studica.com slash robots. No rough edges and a versatile hole pattern allow for positioning at multiple angles. Teams in the U.S., you can request a free sample, apply for team grants, and register for 25% off at studica.com slash robots.